And we will begin this meeting at 302. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Jay Kennedy, Chair of Midway Pacific Highway Community Planning Group. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, so we've called this meeting to order. We don't have minutes to approve. Uh, we'll kick off with a few minutes of public comment and then I know that we're gonna wanna get into our, our presentation from Chair Fletcher. So if you have a comment from the public that is not related to the items on today's agenda, now is the time, please raise your hand or come off mute. Pause for a moment and wait. Again, this is the portion of our agenda that is non-agenda public comment. I do see DA Summer Stefan. Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good to be with you and good to see uh, Chair Fletcher on too. Yeah, I know. We somehow went, uh, we, we went for it today. We got a big, big meeting with a couple of really important topics. So not seeing any hands from the public. Uh, Chair Fletcher, I'll kick it over to you to uh, begin our informational items. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, DK. Uh, thank you. It's good to see you. I, uh, I I miss seeing you in person. I used to see you all the time, but it's good to see you here. And thank you, everyone, for joining, uh, in particular, to our, our wonderful uh, district attorney, uh, Summer Stefan, for being here. Um, you know, I just wanted to come on for a few minutes and share with you um, a little bit of, of what is in the works and being planned uh, around the shelter location uh, proposed and moving forward uh, on the county complex at Rosecrans. Um, in the uh, in the Midway area. I know that there will be questions uh, and comments from folks. And so along with myself, uh, we're very fortunate. This is a, uh, a team effort and a lot of folks are involved in this. And so we've got Barbara Jimenez from the County um, Operations Officer for our Department of Homeless Solutions and Equitable Communities. We have uh, some behavioral health county staff who are here with us as well. Um, Hafsa is here from the city, uh, Director of Homeless Strategies and Solutions. Lisa Jones from the Housing Commission and Drew uh, Mosier from the Lucky Duck Foundation. Um, and all of us together are, are coming together to try and meet uh, what we have, have been told is a need, uh, in particular in the Midway area, in particular in Rosecrans, um, at, at times urgent need uh, for some sheltering capacity so that we can get some people off the streets um, and get them into services. And I know uh, folks throughout Midway are very frustrated with the situation there, and I understand that. Um, and it has driven us to a point where, where we are acting in response uh, to a lot of the concerns we've heard. Uh, I've also been doing this long enough to know that uh, folks may be both simultaneously demanding action on homeless and simultaneously uh, concerned about, about locations or, or how a thing will work. And so we're really here to kind of walk through uh, what we're doing, uh, what is in mind, what is intended, uh, why we think it'll be good from the community, and then also hear from folks input um, as we uh, as we move forward on this this proposal, um, I really want to thank the Lucky Duck Foundation, um, Dan Shea and Peter Seiler and Drew, uh, who are here today. They they have a a sprung structure, a, a hardened structure um, that was in use for a while, and then the previous administration at the city took it down from where it was. Uh, another city was going to take it. They ended up not taking it. And when we see such an urgent need on our streets, to know that we have a facility that can house up to 150 people. Uh, sitting in storage with a nonprofit that is willing to not only not charge us for the structure, but also willing to pay to set it up uh, was an offer that I felt like we needed to uh, to really move forward on. And so working with the city, uh, with the Housing Commission, uh, with our behavioral health services team, uh, we really identified this, uh, this location because one, as I mentioned earlier, it meets a community need, a community that, that has the really serious problem of, of chronic and long-term homelessness. But also in particular because of its its literal, literally adjacency uh, to the psych hospital in Rosecrans, and I know there's been a lot of uh, frustration with folks perhaps being discharged from there uh, with nowhere to go and, and joining the area. And so um, we have uh, have worked collaboratively with the mayor, with Councilmember Campbell, uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer will be inheriting uh, this area of San Diego with the new redistricting coming forward. When we started this, it was in my district. Uh, redistricting shuffled us as well, but District 3 and Supervisor Lost Reamer have been very helpful um, to this. But it'll be a low barrier, uh, just in time emergency shelter for individuals uh, who have uh, have otherwise not been able to access a place to stay. And the key, I think, is that in addition to the standard kind of portfolio of shelter services, uh, this facility will provide access to on site behavioral health care assessments, uh, to care coordination and connections to a variety of community resources uh, that are made available through the county behavioral health uh, department. Uh, in fact, behavioral health will be on site to provide these services, making them easier to ac uh, access, to help create the relationships and the keys to trying to get people into long-term 
uh, successful outcomes. And we think that this uh, will work well. Obviously, we've moved forward with the high need individuals in our community harm reduction shelters. Um, and, and, you know, this is not designed for that population, um, but this is designed to get people off the streets um, and, uh, and get them into uh, a transition into a, a permanent uh, solution and into uh, permanent housing. Um, you know, the Housing Commission has specifically created a, a, a position of coordinator to ensure people who exit have transportation and, and ways. Uh, the city is obviously a, a, a deep uh, attached together partner uh, who is contributing significant funding to uh, help ensure the operations and security um, of this. And then Lucky Duck, again, has a role. So, you know, we've got a whole bunch of partners here. City of San Diego Housing Commission, they're going to be in charge of the shelter operations, which is 24-7, including referrals, intake, service coordination, security, meals, hygiene, and cleaning. Um, they're also going to lean into housing as the shelter is meant to be a short-term solution. Uh, these clients in transitioning uh, to the most appropriate uh, long-term or permanent supports and housing opportunities. City and Housing Commission will also be responsible for transportation services, showers, restrooms, laundry, security, uh, and ongoing maintenance. Um, as a county, uh, we are giving up the land uh, on our, uh, our property there in, uh, in Rosecrans. Uh, we will also be providing behavioral health services um, the, we're doing a lot of site improvements on the land and, and that along with the screening assessment on site behavioral health services, uh, the public health education and screenings. Uh, and we will have human services specialists there to uh, help sign people up and connect them to self sufficiency resources. And then Lucky Duck, our wonderful partners, donating the use of the shelter structure and also the construction um, of the structure today. Um, we're not here today to tell you that this one shelter, 150 bed, is going to solve homelessness in San Diego. Uh, we are acutely aware that the root cause of homelessness is poverty. And the only way to make substantive progress on this very complicated issue uh, is, is to tackle the root cause and try and stop people that are sliding into homelessness uh, while we do everything we can to get as many people off the streets um, and connected to, uh, to ongoing services. And so, you know, we think this is a positive direction. We obviously, I know and understand folks are always, again, both simultaneously concerned about unsheltered folks who are in their community and at times can also have concerns about attempts to get them off the streets and, and into shelter. And we want to be sensitive to that and, and aware of that um, while also, you know, understanding the tremendous obligation we have to, uh, to need to act to be able to help alleviate the condition uh, in our streets. Um, but with that, I want to kick it over to a few of our partners um, who are going to provide a, uh, a little update and, uh, and share a little bit about this. Uh, first, I want to introduce Hafsa, who's Mayor Gloria's Director of Homeless Strategies and Solutions, uh, who can speak about it a little bit. Hafsa? Thank you, Chair Fletcher. And that was such a great uh, synopsis of all the incredible work. DK, I just want to say thank you so much for bringing um, everyone together. And I echo uh, Chair Fletcher's sentiments on all the incredible uh, partners that he listed. We are so grateful for everyone's work. Uh, you know, one of the things that Mayor Gloria has done is um, help elevate the Homeless Strategies and Solutions Department to help support the work that we are seeing today happening. The internal coordination, the external coordination, it takes a lot of bandwidth capacity and technical assistance to help bring people together and to help go ahead and move forward on these uh, new initiatives. And so with that being said, I just do want to be able to say, what are some of the key points on how this impacts the overarching strategy, right? So the overarching strategy is housing first. And as Chair Fletcher mentioned, you know, leaning in with the Housing Commission, we want to be able to move, continue move people into permanent housing, affordable housing, but but shelter is also a way to get people immediately off the street, which also impacts the quality of life that we see across the board. The best way to help her, that person who's on the street, on the curb, get off and into permanent housing can be through the nexus of shelter. And uh, we're really excited that the county is leaning in from the support of behavioral health services. We know that that has been a huge impact in the population that are being served. And we want to be able to ensure that there is that added support. So we're very grateful for that as well. Another piece that I did want to mention is this really aligns with the community action plan that our council had adopted back in 2019. And that um, <clears throat> is something that we've all been working collectively together with all the partners on this call is making sure that we are decreasing the unsheltered population. 
And this is how we do it. And this is how we do it um, quickly and expeditiously. Uh, so as I mentioned, I think some of the major components that meets the strategies across the board is housing first, is meeting the objectives of our community action plan one by one through shelter, through outreach, through permanent housing, through the supportive services, wraparound supportive services. And then also this meets the Matthew Doherty recommendations that the city adopted as well in terms of really strengthening the internal collaboration. This is a huge project and we're so grateful for the philanthropy work work as well of Lucky Duck Partners, and we're bringing all of it together from all of the stakeholders to go ahead and launch and get people off the street. So with Chair Fletcher, I'll punt that back to you. And I also have, you know, Lisa is also on the call here, who's uh, critical as it's relative to the operations. So if there's anything else you'd like to add, or we could wait for the question. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Austin. Again, thank you to the city. Uh, this really has been a, a team effort and a joint effort, and, and we appreciate that. So, DK, let me kick it back to you. We're happy to open up for questions, comments, thoughts. Uh, we got a whole uh, team of folks that are here uh, who can uh, who can most appropriately uh, jump in and uh, answer questions or provide insights, uh, whatever whatever uh, works best. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, uh, both uh, Chair Fletcher and Hofstra from the mayor's office. Uh, I think we'll start with board questions and comments, right? So, if you're a member of the the board of here of our planning group. Uh, and you'd like to ask a question or follow up, uh, now's the time. I'd say go ahead and raise your hand or come off mute, and then we'll go over to the general public. But right now I'm calling for board questions, comments, responses to what we've just heard. Is there anyone from the group? Okay, not hearing anything from the group. If there is anyone from the general public, I'd say now's a good time to go ahead and raise your hand. Um, and we're happy to acknowledge you and, and facilitate this conversation. I know that at least for, for me, I can kind of maybe warm us up. Uh, to your point, Chair Fletcher, this has been an ongoing conversation that we've had in this community for a long time. You know, we spend a lot of time as a planning group trying to do what we can to, uh, improve, our, <laughs> to improve our conditions, frankly. Uh, the encampment down Sports Center Boulevard, you know, I think that's obviously something that's gotten a lot of attention over the last few years now at this point. Uh, can you talk a little bit more just about how you aim to actually, I don't know, I don't think recruit is the right word, but populate the shelter, right? Where, where are these folks going to be coming from and, and what is it exactly that we see from a flow standpoint, right? How long do uh, you anticipate folks staying uh, at the shelter? Yeah. Ultimately, what's that transition plan uh, to, to ultimately, you know, help these folks out? Yeah, I will. Uh, I'm going to kick it here, both to Hafsa and perhaps Barbara Jimenez, uh, who, who may want to weigh in on this. And you know, the, the, the reality is, um, you know, there are more than 150 unsheltered folks in the Midway area. And, you know, some of those folks, again, we have outreach workers and teams that go out um, and are designed to, to help facilitate and get people in here. Um, and again, obviously a shelter solves sleep, right? Housing solves homelessness. We know that, we understand that. Uh, but we also know that this, this is the first place you get them indoors, you get them in shelter, you get them connected to services and it makes it exponentially easier to get them into that permanent uh, home-based situation. So let me go to, to Hopsa and Barbara, if you wanna talk about any of that kind of outreach efforts, kind of ideal timelines for how long people would be there, uh, all, all of those those types of things. It's a really yeah, good question. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll shortly punt it to Barbara here because I know um, uh, about the incredible work that the county's doing to do the outreach. Um, I will say that with the Housing Commission um, and our providers, we have a very robust coordinated outreach team and they're constantly hitting the streets, pounding the pavements to make sure that there is established rapport to get people into shelter or even permanent options as quick as possible. So DK, I think one of the things that I'd like to mention to that question is also the, the priority of hearing folks that have lived experience, right? This is a national best practice. And when our teams are out there, we're asking them, what is going to work? What do you need? What, what, how could we be more supportive? And so hearing that this is also supported by lived experience persons, that also is um, huge as it's relative to getting folks off the streets. And Barbara, hunting to you. Yeah, you guys both did, of course, an amazing job of covering it. The outreach is critical. Getting to know and engaging with individuals is really important. Um, and having the full array of resources available, right? So if someone is a veteran and we need to connect them to the veteran services and possible bash um, housing, things of that nature. Uh, so outreach consistently working together is huge and that's what we'll be focusing on. I'll, um, I'll just add to that too. And I think to the point about the conversation around um, the sort of encampment in the sports arena area, there's been a lot of work with the outreach teams 
over the last several months, really working on building those relationships, both from the CHART team, but also from the city's coordinated outreach team. And those, those teams are, are neighborhood based. So they stay in those same neighborhoods, building those relationships over time. So knowing that this is coming is definitely gonna be part of their work going forward. And I think the other thing, really hearing um, from, at, to Hofsa's point, persons with lived experience and from the outreach teams themselves, is that being able to accommodate, and Chair Flencher mentioned this, 24 hour intakes. So when someone decides, okay, it's 1030 at night, I'm done tonight, I want a place to stay, we can accommodate that. So the, the model that we're building out in this shelter is a little different to be really low barrier and to be more accommodating to, to meet people where they are in that moment. Because there's something to sort of that critical time intervention where this is the moment that I'm saying yes, and then being able to have the resources in place to accommodate that both from an outreach standpoint and from the shelter standpoint is important. So we, we built that into that. And I think that in particular with some of the populations you see down in your own neighborhoods in the community there, it's gonna be an effective approach in getting people to engage where they might not have before. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, go on. No, 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 that was good. I was just thinking of, we were both thinking of. Here we go, here we go. Um, I think for, for me, I, you know, I'm just sort of brainstorming here, but, but when we talk about uh, these shelters, you, you'd mentioned a date that this is anticipated to open. Can you, can you refresh me on, on when you anticipate yeah. opening? Yeah, we're aiming for the beginning of July um, is, uh, is, 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 is when we're aiming to, uh, to have it up. It may, may fluctuate a little bit, um, but we're moving as quick as we can. There was a lot of site improvements we had to do. Uh, to, to make the site ready and able and power and water and, and kind of all of those components and getting the structure up uh, and then getting the service providers uh, on board and, uh, and ready to staff it. Okay, okay. And so will we have an update that's definitive, uh, I suppose, when, before this does actually open? Yeah, right, right now it's as, it's as soon as we possibly can, early July, but we absolutely, uh, DK, as, as we get hone in on, it, on an actual date, uh, we will absolutely let you all know um, you know, when we expect and, and then, you know, we can share timelines this is going to be kind of a soft opening. We're going to bring it part capacity, full capacity, you know, we'll just keep you posted on all of that as, as we go. I think the need is so urgent and so great. Uh, we are trying to move with the sense of urgency, um, recognizing we got to do it right. I mean, this is not something that you just sloppily throw together and have it, have it not, you know, be good to do this and do it right. And again, you know, the goal would be other than seeing a large structure right there, you know, the surrounding communities wouldn't really know what was happening, except there'd be a lot fewer people on the streets in that area. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, to that effect is, is what mechanisms or, or methods are you using to, to measure your success and progress? And, you know, in the mm -hmm. event that those of us in the community do see changes that we'd like to, to incorporate our feedback to, how does, how does that all work out? Yeah, let me kick it to Hafsa and Barbara on kind of how we measure kind of transition, you know, permanent supportive placements, how many people come in here and, and, and arrive at a thing, length of stays, kind of some of those metrics we look at um, for, for its success. And then in terms of ongoing engagement, I mean, I think it's gotta be an ongoing conversation. As issues pop up, uh, we've gotta hear them, we've gotta figure out how we can address them and work through them. And so I really view that as, a, as an ongoing, you know, every month throughout the duration, um, you know, of this a, a kind of ongoing accessibility and openness that we have to have uh, to make sure we're listening to the community, to, to make sure we're doing it right. Uh, but let me go to Hafsa and, and Barbara and Lisa, anyone who wants to jump in on kind of general shelter operations and how, how you assess, uh, uh, assess their, their relative success and uh, accountability. Yeah, I think that, they, and DK, that's an excellent question. And that really speaks to another priority that Mayor Gloria has in, in collaboration with all the partners here in, in the county is really looking at a data-driven approach, right? Making sure that data is at the forefront. And so two things that's very unique and beautiful about this project is that there have been constant coordination and weekly meetings with several of the partners here um, from, from the experts on boots on the ground um, and those who are working within the site planning too, to make sure that there is all I's are dotted and T's are crossed. So for example, when we're looking at data, data we're looking at how can we quickly get people off the street as soon as possible? How could we quickly get them into the shelter and then also connect them to the supportive services? How can there also be a nexus of finding out if people already have housing attached and where is the crack for in the system for them? And that's the case management. Um, so, you know, I think uh, Barbara ha has been in those calls as well. Her team, Cecily and folks, Lisa, and, uh, you know, we hope to have a, a dashboard. I certainly would love to see a dashboard regarding this 
know Lisa and, and the Housing Commission is, is, is working through that, but I you know, would want to open it up if you want to add additional to those reference points. Absolutely. Barbara, do you want to jump in or shall I? Go ahead and then I can go after you. Okay. <laughs> there, you got too many people on here that have information they can share, right? Um, so I will say just um, from just sort of like a communications and circulate, circling back perspective, DK, I think you and the board know that since the harm reduction shelter um, started, I've been coming on every month to provide updates. I absolutely commit to continue to join monthly and, and to bring those updates into this space as well. Um, you know, the all of these agencies, the county, the commission, the city, um, BHS, and then of course the operators generally meet weekly on these projects. And so when I come forward to you, I always make sure that that's inclusive of, of those updates as well. So we'll continue to do that. But from sort of like a success standpoint, I see success in a couple of ways. And from a community perspective, one of the biggest successes is, is it helping getting folks off of the street in your community? Obviously, that's a success in itself. But also when people choose, and Chair Fletcher spoke to this really, you know, really keenly, but also when people come, we do know that sometimes people don't stay in shelter, right? We do know that people come into shelter, they exit out. So as bearing that in mind in the conversations that um, the planning group has shared with our leadership to date, one of the things we did is also build in engagement positions that for someone who exits the shelter, but doesn't exit to that next step, like they just decide to leave, their goal of those engagement positions is to go out into the community and make sure that we are re-engaging them, either getting them back into shelter or to be really frank with you, if they don't want to go back into shelter, to transport them to wherever they want to go. Because if they didn't come from your community, then they likely came from a place where they have supports and they feel connected. People tend to have a geographic home, even if it's not a traditional home that we think of where their support network is. So we very intentionally built in engagement resources as part of that to make sure that not only are we doing a good job to target the folks in your community to come into shelter, but if people exit not to housing or not to the next thing, that they don't, are not then becoming impactful in your community. We are working with them still to get them to that next step whatever that is, even if it's not that shelter environment. So that I think is a real positive outcome that we want to track and get feedback on from the community. And then of course, the big outcomes to everybody's point are always who's getting into a longer term housing resource, who's getting into a permanent housing resource. And longer term might mean a residential treatment facility. It might mean adult independent living care. It might mean a variety of different options that best meets those people's needs at the time. So we're working collectively on how we can collect that data and report out on that as well. I would just add, uh, Lisa, that from the behavioral health services perspective, we are looking at all, all of those measures in addition to, for us, connection to uh, services that people may be interested in receiving and qualifying for. And in the event that folks fall all out of uh, shelter, if they leave the shelter, that will not mean that they necessarily have left treatment services. So our work is to make sure that they stay engaged in the services that they're connected to, whether that, to Lisa's point, the residential services or outpatient services. Our focus is really the underlying uh, issues that are that can uh, be associated with both homelessness um, in general, but also uh, with just the difficult uh, lives that these folks have living on the streets. So in tandem, working alongside the city and with the Housing Commission collectively, we really have a very robust um, measurements in place to make sure that this is a success and specifically for the people that we're serving. So not only for the community, but for the people that we're serving, making sure that we're making a difference and connecting them to the services that they need. Awesome. Thank you. And, and Lisa, you, you mentioned the fact that you've been here uh, religiously, frankly, for the last what year now or so. And I, one, I'd like to say I appreciate that. And two, uh, you've set the expectation. You've set the bar <laughs> for attendance and for representation. And so uh, I'm encouraged to see that you're continuing to be here. I'm encouraged to see uh, sort of the camaraderie and I think the teamwork and the partnership, frankly, between all these different agencies. Um, and I would like to just kind of underscore and say, you know, as I call one more last time, if there are any other questions or comments from the board or the public, uh, I think it's really important that we continue to continue this conversation. So um, there's a question in the chat from Christine saying, uh, where will these metrics be posted publicly? Which I think is a good question. Will they be posted somewhere publicly? And if so, where? So um, we do have dashboards on our website that post about programs, how shelters performing, how rapid rehousing is performing, how permanent supportive housing, how outreach are performing. We don't have them down to the program level, 
but that's certainly something that I can we can come back and share. Like I said, we are all collectively identifying what we want to make sure we are elevating as far as outcomes. And and we'll have a working group that's working on that right now. I see everybody nodding. <laughs> so, um, but we can also come back and make sure that that is publicly made available um, through our, our monthly check-ins too with your team. Thank you. Um, and you, you can, I just want to, I want to thank, you know, I want to thank you. I want to thank everyone involved. Look, it, it's the, the, the problem is great, uh, but in so many communities, uh, communities that the solution becomes very evasive uh, in terms of, of it's, it's, you know, people say, hey, deal with homelessness, but then uh, a long line of folks opposing any effort. We know we've got an obligation collectively to make sure we do this right. Uh, to make sure that it is run safely and securely and it provides good services and, and we're going to live up to our obligation on this. Um, but, you know, we, we really appreciate everyone's uh, work in, uh, in getting us to this point and, and support of the efforts. Um, you know, we know homelessness is a problem across the entire county, but we know it's particularly acute uh, in the Midway area and in the Rosecrans issue. And so we're, we're here to uh, try and, and make a difference and, uh, and, and, and show, show progress. And so you know, continue dialogue and engagement as we as we move forward. Uh, but you know, appreciate the opportunity to uh, to join you all and talk, and, and we will certainly be, be on hand to come back as we move forward. Yeah, no, I appreciate it very much. And, and as you said, this is an ongoing conversation, so you know where yep. to find us. We know where to find you, and we'll certainly continue. Uh, we'll continue this whole process. So thank you. And thank you. Now we'll move to our next informational item, which is a similar but different sort of angle on the same conversation. Uh, we're very excited, I think for the first time ever, at least in my four years on this board, to welcome District Attorney Summer Steffen uh, to our group uh, to give us a different kind of presentation on how her office's work uh, intersects with the conversation around homelessness. So uh, District Attorney Steffen, please go ahead, take it away. Great, so great to be with you. And, and we picked a perfect day because it's, uh, it really shows that this issue of uh, people experiencing homelessness is very complex and the way to best solve it is to connect and intersect and collaborate from no one has one solution. It is a multifaceted solution. What I'm going to offer you today um, is some data that has never been shared before because it has never been collected before um, that I shared publicly on March 26th of this year. Um, I'm going to share with you um, a three-point plan that we, from our perspective as the DA's office, feel is a very um, is a is a very action-packed and uh, results-oriented plan. But it can only work with all of the support of the people that you have on today: the the chair, Chair Fletcher, Mayor um, Gloria. Um, Lisa Jones and, and everybody from behavioral health and primarily the community. So I'm gonna try to pack a lot in a little bit of time. Um, just to set a perspective of where I come from, the DA's office is your people's prosecutor for all felony crime across the entire county. So we are responsible, we have jurisdiction in all 18 cities um, and unincorporated areas. Um, I have um, humbly served all 3.3 million people in San Diego County. On a daily basis, I work with my 12 police chiefs, including Chief Nislight and the, all of the sheriff's substations to bring about um, solutions regarding public safety trends. I'm supposed to be the top public safety official in the county. I try to think of everything as working together, collaboration, um, but it does give me the privilege of being able to see the data from across the entire county. So anecdotally, every police department and pretty much every community meeting I've gone to since becoming a DA in 2019, uh, the subject of crime and homelessness comes up. Um, people talk to me about the problems regarding poverty, but they also talk to me about their feelings of trepidation, of fear, of um, having their businesses not be able to thrive, having their places where they live um, produce a feeling of unsafety as they walk 
walk out uh, the door. And um, I, I searched and searched because anecdotal information is just not good enough. Because if you just have anecdotal, that can be based on stereotypes or other things, biases, prejudices, that is just not the way we go as, as the DA's office. Our mission is to um, produce fair and equal justice for all and, and to build safe communities in partnership with the community we serve. Um, just to kind of sidestep as to misdemeanor crime, it is the city attorney's office, uh, Mara Elliott, that handles the city of San Diego's misdemeanor crimes. We work in collaboration to have similar policies. Um, we, you know, it is all about working together. We have uh, the felony crime in the city of San Diego across the 18 cities and misdemeanor crime in the 17 other cities in San Diego County. So two years ago, I asked my uh, crime intelligence analysts and my IT team to begin tracking every felony case that comes into our office by way of whether the victim or the perpetrator was experiencing homelessness. Um, and I, uh, after meeting with the community and, and a lot of people that want to make sure we have equity in our data, um, I, I wanted only the data as to cases we actually file on a beyond a reasonable doubt standard so that we're not guessing about whether the crime was really committed by this person or not, or whether the person was truly a victim of this crime or not. The data is pretty astounding and it's the first of its kind in the nation. It um, shows that uh, using best available data that um, both on the victim side of being victims of crime, uh, people who are homeless are, um, are subjected to attempt murder at 27 times the rate of somebody who is not homeless. That means 27,000% higher rate. Um, this at 19 times more to murder, sexual assault, everything else. On the other side, when we look at, for example, robberies, um, folks who are experiencing homelessness um, are um, responsible for robbery at 175 times higher than people who are not homeless. That's 175,000 times percent higher. Uh, same with residential burglary, same with aggravated assaults. Uh, about 130 times higher. Arson is pretty astounding. And I just met with all my fire chiefs from across the county who wanted to learn this data because anecdotally, they know that they're responding to encampments and fires set in uh, tents and makeshift homes um, at an at a astronomical rate, but they didn't have the data to support it. And now we know that also arson is committed at a 514 times higher rate um, in uh, the folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, this data also, um, we augmented the data with data from the medical examiner where it showed what a lot of the providers have been telling me they carry Narcan with them. They can't keep up with the number of overdoses on the street. And the coroner confirmed that folks who are experiencing homelessness are overdosing at 108% the rate of folks who are not homeless. So what the conclusion of this, and there's a lot more data and Cameron Celeste, um, uh, our assistant director of government community affairs, has posted that data for you to, to study it. But the conclusion of this data is that homelessness is, is a humanitarian crisis, but it is also a public safety crisis. And the solutions we have to bring then um, have to include public safety. So um, many people who know me, I, I grew up 28 years fighting crime, creating systems for the most vulnerable, 
for human trafficking victims, for the, the, the people who are subjected to the most abuse, hate crimes and the like. And um, it was really important to me that, that we um, have the data to know whether this is a lane that we can bring some real assistance to. So with that information, we then went to what are the solutions. And here we had already built on many solutions we had worked on in a mental health report uh, with the county that has been incredibly supportive, including the opening of the first and second crisis stabilization centers to allow police, instead of taking people to jail to and families 24 seven to drop off somebody un, for just under 24 hours for mental health or substance abuse treatment. We opened the first one and there was a lot of trepidation because people were worried it was an, an increased crime. Again, the data came to help us. We were able to demonstrate that across the nation when these have been built, they've decreased crime. And uh, so we opened the first one. It's been utilized since October 1800 um, times. So it is quite a need and we know that there are solutions for it. Um, now, I'm gonna quickly go through the solutions. The number, and, and I'm very excited that both Mayor Gloria himself, Chair Fletcher have, have really deep dived with their team on these to see how the solutions we're proposing are augmenting. They can't be replacing, but come alongside the solutions that they've been working on for many years. And the number one solution I borrowed from our experience during the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, we knew that our victims of domestic violence, human trafficking were trapped with their abusers. They had only one chance to make one call to escape and to have safe shelter. We invited the largest non and oldest non-profit technology company in the United States that's been around since the 70s to San Diego. We asked them to help us make all of our shelter beds connect and have a specific assessment driven for the needs of the individual so that we can make one call and house a victim. Within months of all 25 of the major nonprofits that serve victims came together, we uh, brought it down where 86% of our victims were sheltered within about eight minutes. They began to find their safe shelter that suited their needs successfully at 86% rate. Um, we, uh, after experiencing this tremendous success that I know has saved lives, I invited uh, several conversations with this technology uh, guru, and I asked them, if we asked you to create for San Diego County a system like you did for our victims, picture a hotels.com where in real time, you can find out what shelter or transitional home or residential treatment home is available in real time with an assessment that all the providers agree on. Does the person have disabilities? What's their age? Are they LGBTQ with special um, you know, requirements? Is it a mother with children? Is it an older male? What do they have pets that they can't part with? Doing that assessment, could we take the system that we successfully did for our victims and bring it as a first of its kind solution in the nation for housing and sheltering in a compassionate, humane way that brings the needs of the individual with the sheltering to San Diego? And the answer is an absolute yes. They, they've been doing this kind of innovation for years. They've never done it in this area, but there is nothing to expanding something you've already done for victims to a wider population. 
Now, this helps in multiple ways. This not only helps in terms of actually matching a person's needs. And of course, I'm not talking about a two bedroom home. Uh, that is the ultimate goal. I'm talking about what are humane interim solutions that we can do. And are we able to do this in real time? Um, and the answer is, of course, yes. But the other part why this is so important is because, as you all know and have experienced in your community, uh, multiple times and on multiple occasions, there is a case that passed in 2018 called Martin versus Boise that says you cannot ask someone to leave their encampment, their tent on the street, unless you have shelter for them. But the issue is we don't actually know if we have shelter in real time. So the beauty of this system is what, what Chair Fletcher, Mayor Gloria's cooperation with Lucky Duck for this place, people could say no over and over and over or to any place. But if you can show that you actually have this availability and it is suitable through the assessment that's done instantaneously, then you are actually able to marry technology in real time with the availability of shelter. Um, the second solution is, um, is to um, create a three-tier diversion program that provides an incentive for folks who are um, deep into substance abuse with a combination of mental health where they're not able to accept the help they're given and they need that incentive and the incentive that can be given is through uh, is since we know from the data crimes are being committed is being able to take the low and mid level crime before it escalates into violence and offer a treatment court that is specific to the needs of folks who have the intersection of homeless mental health and substance abuse. And the last solution is a legislative fix, which we wrote out and we're very thankful that we see that the language was, um, th there was language already in assembly member Eggman's uh, bill, but now we see that the language actually mirrors the language we proposed, which is to lower the, the standard of gravely disabled, just like Illinois, Vermont, Colorado, and many states who have less of a problem with homelessness so that you can treat the problem before it becomes extreme. Of course, I have a lot more. The documents are all written. I believe in having everything available, transparent, it's on our website. We have the three-point plan written out. You're lucky it's only 18 pages because we want it to be digestible. Um, but if you want to deep dive with us on data or anything, we're happy to do it. Um, but um, I'm very excited about this. I'm excited that the leadership from the city and many cities and the county is, is definitely exploring our three-point plan. Awesome. Well, thank thank you so much, uh, DA Stefan. I, I think it's really, um, I think representative, right, to that that uh, cohesion, right? The fact that you're here alongside our chair Fletcher and all these different agencies. Clearly, this is quite this is you know, quite quite possibly the biggest conversation and the single greatest issue that our community is facing. And so, I appreciate your time and attention. I appreciate the the data and the details. Um, I'll open it up now if you have a few more minutes uh, for questions okay. from the board. If you're a member of the board of the Midway Pacific Highway Community Planning Group and you have a question or a comment, I'd encourage you now to raise your hand or um, just go ahead and come off mute while we're here. I think I saw Kathy jump in. I saw Amy jump in as well. So you guys, welcome. Good to see you all. Um, but not seeing any hands or hearing any voices. There we go, Quentin. Hello, Quentin, go ahead. Hello there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, and the kids. Oh, cool. Um, that is spectacular data that you've generated. That is amazing. Um, 
uh, and being able to offer these people res you know, a, a solution on the spot and being able to make that determination in real time so that action can actually happen. Um, fantastic. Uh, um, my question was going to be, uh, <laughs> um, I got you so excited. You can't, uh, that's, that's really good. I, I, I almost don't know what to say. I was trying to recap it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, have you guys quantified the cost in public services that all of this data, um, you know, because there's this cost, the emergency room services, um, the police response, all the firefighters having to go put out all these fires, the cost of all these public services, right? That if, if, if you know, this is reactive public services cost. Whereas, you know, if we have some of these human services in place, you know, of course there's a cost with that, which everybody seems to be very, very focused on all the time, right? Um, is, oh my God, these services are gonna cost so much. But if you have the data to support, you know, what the public services cost on the back end, then you can say, look, we're getting 10 cents on the dollar. If we, if we offer a public service that puts this fire out before it becomes a fire, okay, you know, it's gonna save us 10 cents on the dollar compared to the reactive cost, right? Absolutely, Quentin. You know, we haven't uh, quantified it. We just, we, we know that it's there. We know that there were 54,000 mental health calls in the county. We know um, the cost, you know, that fire is responding. You know, now we know 514 times higher rate to, to uh, the intersection with homelessness. We know that all of the, the, the crime and the impact on victims and communities. And we also know the human cost to people, just very simply, people cannot receive viable treatment for mental health or substance abuse if they are not sheltered. It's not possible. And the drug dealers know that. They are, they are targeting people. They are targeting people for the fact that they have this vulnerability for it for addiction and substance abuse. So, so we have to turn this around and obviously I can't do it alone. It's, it's, it's augmenting with everything that's happening and also making sure that this app is gonna provide us with what are the gaps. You know, it's gonna tell us when we can shelter someone, why is it? What is it that we need to bring on board that we didn't have before? But it's a great idea. I'll start looking into different sources on how to quantify that. Yeah, yeah, just a quantification of the public cost of all these occurrences of these different, you know, manifestations of crime, right? Yes. Um, th there's a public service cost, and and I would be willing to bet that um, on a preventative, you know, public services nature, like that cost. You know, you can demonstrate savings of cost, you know, by by taking a preventative approach versus a reactive approach. And and that's fantastic data that you've generated. Like that's the kind of thing where you can generate that kind of those kind of cost quantifications, right? Right. Absolutely. Thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, well, that's that's my 10 cents. I'll I'll be quiet now. I'm done. <laughs> well, thank you, Quentin. That was a good question as well. Um, we'll go again back. Uh, if there's any questions from the board, any other members of the board here today would like to, uh, whether it's submit feedback or ask a question. I know there's a lot of data in here, and so I know I'll be spending some time digesting it, and, and I'll certainly be in touch with your office, uh, Summer Stefan, because I want to make sure we continue our conversation and make sure that we're aware of what we can do as a planning group. I recognize we're a planning group, right? Land use designation, that's really what we're here for. But to the extent that we can, um, you know, engage on this issue, I think that we, we, we should, frankly. That would be great. Yeah, so again, if there's anyone from the board, now's a good time. And not hearing any questions from the board, I'll go out to the general public if you're here today. 
Uh, I feel like there's some folks from the media I see that as well. If you have questions, now's a good time as well. Um, otherwise, hearing none, I'll just uh, close by saying once again, thank you very much for coming and for sharing. And, and I know that I'll, I'll go ahead and distribute these documents to the board and to my distribution list as well. And yeah, we'll just continue this conversation. And thank you to, to Cameron for helping to set this up as well. Thank you, thank DK. You. Oh, thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Yeah. Cheers. Take care. Cool. All right. So now we, we kind of switch things around a little bit. We, you know, we have uh, elected officials with very, very uh, sensitive calendars. And so we've, we've kind of moved our government reports uh, down a little bit in the agenda packing order. Uh, but we're going to go through that process now. So uh, up first from the mayor's office, Coda. And obviously we heard a little bit from your office, but from a different direction. So if there's anything um, else that you have to, to offer, now is a good time. Uh, yeah, I'll keep my uh, my report fairly short, but yeah, thank you guys for having me. My name is Coda Zeiser, Deputy Director of Community Engagement for Mayor Gloria. It's still budget season for us right now, so those are kind of all the updates I have from our office. Just yesterday, the mayor released his May revise, which is essentially the second draft of the budget after taking all of the public input, council member input over the last few weeks. Some of the top line items that are included in the May revise is uh, $500,000 going to a new conservatorship unit within the office of the city attorney. Um, we have a lot of movement at the state level on easing up the conservatorship laws. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we have staff at a local level ready to do that work once, um, you know, once we're at that point. We also have over $5 million being added for more shelter option and safe haven beds. Uh, in terms of public safety, uh, restrooms citywide have been a huge issue, especially in our parks. Um, and so we'll be allocating nearly $2 million for cleaning and security at city park bathrooms. We're also investing an additional $4 million into SDPD officer overtime um, for this next fiscal year. Kind of the upcoming significant dates. Um, like I said, yesterday was the release the May revise. Tomorrow on the 19th, uh, the mayor will be presenting this item at council at 2 p.m. After that, uh, on May 27th, council modification and priority memos are due. June 8th, the independent budget analyst, the IBA, will be releasing their uh, final memo. Uh, and then on June 13th is the final council hearing uh, for it to be approved, after which it'll go to the mayor's desk to be signed. Um, so we probably have, uh, you know, a little under a month left of the budget process, um, but those are kind of the big significant dates. Um, I'll keep relaying, um, you know, information to you guys as I receive them. Um, but that's it for me right now. I'm more than happy to take any questions. Well, I have a quick question and forgive my ignorance on this. I don't know if this is a question for you or maybe Makana in the D2 office, but from our capital improvement uh, priorities list, can you speak a little bit to where that sort of correlates in the budget or does that, or how does that factor in? Now we have a number of different uh, priorities we've identified, both as the yeah. new community, but also D2 overall. Yeah, so we have our uh, kind of the fiscal year like CIP list, um, and it does go off of the council priorities um, that each council member brings forth, as well as additional um, uh, projects that the city, that our office just identifies and funds. Um, I would hand it over to Makana to see if whichever uh, specific D2 ones are in there. I'm just looking at the list right now. The only big one is the Cannon Street Park in District 2. Uh, that's in the Point Loma uh, Peninsula area. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big community win. So that's been underfunded for the last couple of years. So we're allocating a million and a half, uh, 1.5 million going there. Um, everything else in terms of Everything else is pretty heavy infrastructure. Uh, we have circuit upgrades at Sunset Cliffs, pump stations, uh, pretty you know, in District Two quite a bit. Um, all the ones that I see on this one, but the list that I'm working off of was before the May revise was released, so there may be additional projects. Um, and so I can get you the full list of CIP projects in D two that we'll be working on. Cool, thanks. I'm happy to share that with with the, with the board as well. So thank you. Um, any other questions for Coda and the mayor's office? All right, hearing none, we will proceed to McConnor Rowan with the District 2 City Council Office. Thank you, Coda. Hey, everyone. Yeah, McConnor Rowan, Director of Policy for Council Member Campbell. It was a, a big week around here, especially for myself. Like, this is my first day back. I was out for like a week and a half with COVID, uh, pretty symptomatic, but hitting the ground running. So like, uh, just to speak first to the CIP question, I'm gonna spend the rest of my week, this is the point where I'm digging through it to see what made it in the May, in the mayor's May revise before we send our May revise, May revise 
to the IBA for last consideration. So I'll definitely make sure that gets out to DK and I'll work with CODA to see what's D2 specific off the top of my head. I know there's a couple streets in Midway that weren't mentioned yet here, but I'll, I'll, I need to, that's how I'm gonna spend the rest of my week basically digging into that. Um, and uh, we just got through council, uh, the, some of the final pieces of our street vending ordinance and the short-term rental ordinance. So it was a big week around here and I'm focusing back into budget um, in mid midway specific, I've been working with a residence group over at the orchard. Uh, if folks don't know, there's about 700 senior citizens who live over in that corner on Hancock um, to get some safety measures put in place there. So the um, the council member and I are going to be doing a walkthrough over there. Um, and anyway, uh, um, there's an upcoming, you know, there's the biweekly focus over in the uh, encampment area on Sports Arena Boulevard. I uh, was made aware that there's going to be an increased focus as they kind of shift in a cyclical nature. It's coming back to midway soon. So I sent an email to Coda and Offset. We're connecting about that to make sure that more areas like Hancock are included in that. Um, and then lastly, Coda touched on it, but the uh, council member Von Wilpert and council member Campbell were leading the charge in that request for the 500,000. Um, for the conservatorship unit in the city attorney's office. And we are glad to see the mayor not only be super supportive, but actually increase that to 547,000. Um, I'm working on another press conference for <laughs> now talking points to get some more information out about that. But I think that we're all pretty familiar that housing, like Chair Fletcher said, housing is what ends it, but shelter is what's gonna help today, tonight. Um, and so many of those folks who this conservatorship will impact removing those most extreme cases. And there's gonna be plenty of vetting um, and plenty of continual touches from that unit with these people to make sure that they only not only qualify for it, but continue to qualify for a conservatorship in perpetuity. Um, but allowing our homeless service dollars to go much further because those individuals soak up a lot of resources. We were in our research through this, we did a one case study on an individual who had over 500 touches with enforcement in a single year, 112 of those being in one month. So not a, this conservatorship effort is not only gonna help them, it's gonna help every person experiencing homelessness because they're soaking up so much resources right now. So we're really hopeful that, you know, uh, we have wonderful plans for step, if we're at step three, you know, eight, nine, and 10 have wonderful plans, but we're focusing also on walking and chewing gum by <laughs> getting four, seven, four, five, six, seven steps in place as well. And this conservatorship unit is gonna be one of those. So um, I think everybody here knows how to reach me at this point, but happy to take any questions. And I went over, I'm sorry, but there's been a lot. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Good to, good to have you here and thank you for that. Um, I do want to say also thank you as well. So our, our vice chair, Amy, who is part of our group, she lives at the Orchard. So I know you guys are in touch with that and, and, and we're grateful for that effort as well. Um, any other questions for the D2 office? Okay, not hearing any, thank you. And thanks for being easy on me. I also woke up today with a waterfall coming out of my closet. So oh. when I'm off camera, that's what I'm dealing with right now. Excellent, so. excellent. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, good, good week. There we go. Um, thanks everybody. Thank you. From the planning department, do we have an update today? I think I saw Nancy drop in here. She might not be here anymore. So not seeing her on the current list. Um, don't see Officer Sawilla. Lisa, you're still here. I know you've touched on most of what you typically touch on. Anything else outside of the, the shelter operations at the county facility? Uh, no, but that was good timing. So I'm just about to have to jump and I know we're, we're, you're running out of time too. Uh, we are still at 100% at the harm reduction shelter. So happy to see that that is getting utilized the way it should be. Uh, we haven't done a census recently on intakes and, and where they're coming from because that's I think we've mentioned before we don't collect that level of geographic information but we're going to run another census before our next meeting just so that we can you know kind of try to keep bringing that conversation forward I know that's of interest to this board so happy to kind of run a census next time we come on just sort of where folks within you know your area and you know whether it's going any further where they're coming from too okay. And um, and just always want to make sure that people know how to reach me. I think um, I think I always drop my email in the chat, but if I'm happy for you to share that, DK, if you send out you know follow ups from your agendas um, so that you know how to reach me both for the harm reduction shelter and going forward um, that you feel like you have that contact and you can raise issues or concerns if you have them. Awesome, thank you. Any quick questions for, for Lisa before she runs? 
Okay, hearing none, we'll excuse you. Thank you. Thanks, all. Take um, care. I don't see Ashley from the airport. I don't see Rebecca Smith from D2, or excuse me, from D2 uh, County Office. Are you here? Or is it no? Hey, Matt, hey, it's a, I'm, uh, I'm filling in for Rebecca today. So, uh, Welcome. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Amanda Berry, and I'm a health policy advisor for Supervisor Lawson Reamer. And so I'm excited to actually fill in today for Rebecca, who normally attends your meetings and be here for the conversation about the shelter the chair and the housing commission and everybody and want to offer our office and me especially i um co-lead homelessness with my colleague jeff to be a resource to supervisor lawson reamer's office since we have you in our redistricting and really excited about this future together so um please it should be ongoing communication um as things come up we'll be here monthly but um please don't hesitate i'll put my my email in the chat too it is budget season at the county, so um, really uh, kind of big time right now. Um, and we, we should um, have all of your participation. Last year is a $7 billion budget. And so um, that invests in roads, homeless services, parks, coastal areas, climate action, so much more that the county does. And so um, our budget form is happening on Monday, May 23rd at 5 p.m. And that'll be on Zoom and it's an opportunity for dialogue with county staff, with the supervisor to talk about what's in this year's county budget. Um, and then another exciting thing that's coming from our office is um, really um, a big action around autism. Um, supervisor Lawson Reamer is a parent of a child on the autism spectrum and knows that um, she's been hearing from parents with neurodivergent kids as well as neurodivergent adults. Um, and they've they've wanted a, a more inclusive future. So one in 26 Californians are diagnosed with autism spectrum condition, which is the highest in California in California. Um, folks have limited opportunities as they grow up and they're generally underrepresented in the workforce, even though many have skills that folks are looking for like trustworthiness, attention to detail and analytical thinking. Um, and we know that our workforce is stretched thin right now. So it doesn't make any sense not to recruit these talented individuals. And the county is one of the largest employers in the region. And so we have a really unique opportunity to kind of address this. So on June 14th, Supervisor Lawson Ringmer is going to propose that the county of San Diego for the first time specifically reach out and recruit neurodivergent and autistic adults, as well as train our workforce to be more inclusive. So if you have a loved one with autism, you're interested in this topic area, want to be an ally, please reach out to me and um, we'll keep you updated on the policy changes. Um, and then I, I have a, a link for the Youth Opportunity Pass. If you haven't heard about it already, um, it is as of May 1st, all youth ride free on the bus, trolley, coaster, sprinter, um, and it's funded by SANDAG and the County of San Diego. So really exciting time. Um, and that's what I've got for you all today. Happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Too. Thank you. You also just reminded me that tomorrow is bike to work day. Also a big sand egg thing. So if you're into that, go ahead and do that. I'm going to try it. My office is downtown, so we'll see. Um, but I did have one quick question. You mentioned the, the, the budget hearing for the county. So it's Zoom. Is there a link to RSVP or, or where do we find uh, that, that information? Yep, I'm going to put it right in the chat for the RSVP link for May 23rd. Okay. That's our... Um, our um, district's budget hearing. So that's more of a dialogue. That's when you ask questions. There are also opportunities actually tomorrow, Thursday and Friday to make public comment on the county's budget okay. um, during the session. And that'll be throughout the day. So um, there's a link at the bottom from the news center and you can get that there. And if you have questions, sometimes it's hard to navigate. Feel free to reach out to, to me and I can walk you through how to get on the public comment. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions for our District 3 County Representative? Excellent. We are cruising along today. Thank you very much, Amanda. Good to see you. And um, we'll be around. Um, I got an email. So next we go to State Senator, uh, Senate Pro Tem President, Tony Atkins' office. I got an email from Cole saying he would not be able to make it today, but he did include an attachment with his update let me pull that here it's quite long so i'll drop it in the chat for everyone but uh it's basically broken into two big sections one on reproductive rights one on putting wealth to work which is uh her budget proposal uh high level updates on monday may 2nd uh senate pro tem tony atkins along with speaker assembly speaker randon and governor newsom announced that an amendment will be proposed 
to enshrine reproductive rights, including and specifically abortion in our state constitution following a recent majority draft from the Supreme Court opinion overturning longstanding precedent set by Roe v. Wade. I doubt you all want me to read this word for word, but I can put this in the chat for you and I'll do that now. Moving along, I don't see anyone from Chris Ward's office or Scott Peter's office or Sandeg or Naval Base Point Loma um, or MCRD. So that will conclude our government offers reports unless I've missed anyone and you'd like to speak now. Lovely, okay. So actually we're, we're doing all right on time. So now we've got our first action item um, of the day. Scott Burnett, I think I saw you in here. There's a conditional use permit renewal application in front of us. We're actually getting to do what we do as a land use advisory body for the city of San Diego. This has to do with permitting. Um, Scott, I know you're here with us this afternoon. Thank you for spending some time. And uh, the floor is all yours. Now can you hear me? Sorry. No worries. Yeah, we can hear My you. My phone was off. I apologize. Um, thank you for uh, letting us speak. I uh, believe you have the presentation materials that I sent over to the committee earlier that the package that went to the uh, planning department um, for this renewal. It's a renewal that they, all of the um, cannabis outlets are going through. This one was actually one of the original MMCCs um, when they were originally uh, uh, permitted with the CUPs for um, the city. And it's, uh, there's been no change to the project other than a very minor change inside, which is the city's relaxed, uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but uh, the city has modified, is a better term, the requirement for bulletproof uh, glass at the reception area because they discovered that A, the state did not require it, and B, they were not experiencing any issues with that. And so to make it a little more like a uh, uh, typical waiting area, they've allowed us to remove the existing um, bulletproof glass that we had at the uh, entrance area. But in terms of layout, in terms of area dedicated to the dispensary, in terms of the safety issues of the uh, vaults, uh, cameras, uh, all those things, this is exactly the same project. And we have not uh, uh, proposed any changes to the operation. So. Uh, I don't want to uh, take up time going through all the drawings unless the uh, committee has specific questions um, and I'm more than willing to answer those, but I think it's a pretty straightforward from our standpoint uh, renewal. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I, there aren't any um, uh, outstanding safety issues or uh, uh, violations from the uh, code compliance department for this project. And so uh, we're hoping to uh, a, respond to any questions you have about the operation, but b uh, request your approval for uh, permitting this to go forward for the uh, five-year renewal. Actually, I can't, hold on one sec. I can't hear you now. Can, can you hear me now? Sorry, I was I can't, yeah. Um, yeah, would you mind actually pulling up some of those documents and just showing us kind of like zoom out and remind us where, where this facility is? Um, I recognize that the change that you need from us or the approval sure. for us is very minor. Yeah, nope. for the take, for I can the do that. So items, just yeah. stand by while I do share screen. Yeah, I dropped it in the chat, but I'd, I'd like you to kind of just walk us through exactly what's going on here. So can you uh, enable screen sharing for me, please? Yeah, sorry. Let's see. Okay, you should have that authority now. Yep, let's try it now. Yep. Hold on. There's the drawings, screen to share. Okay, uh, let me reduce that scale a little. So um, these are the drawings that are actually at the city right now, and I'll zoom in and please feel free to ask questions while I'm describing this. This is located at 3500 Estadio. The uh, building is at the corner of Estadio and uh, Kurtz. Uh, it's a two-story building. The dispensary is only located on the first floor. The uh, area is 4,280 square feet. Uh, it has not changed uh, in terms of the area. Uh, the parking, uh, again, I can do as, you know, as much detail as you want, but basically it's a pretty straightforward parking situation. Parking comes in, this is under a shared parking agreement uh, because these lots over here are actually uh, owned by another entity, but come through uh, and then go out here onto uh, Kurtz. 
as part of the original uh, working drawings submittal after the original uh, CUP was approved, the city requested a uh, accessibility entrance, which we have now. I'll zoom a little bit on that up here. Um, so that's a series of ramp uh, that allows uh, access out to uh, the street. So it has the required uh, accessibility access from the public right of way. Um, this is the, you can see my cursor, but the main dispensary is here. The glass that I was talking about is right here. This is the reception area. People come in under a controlled door. There is a uh, guard uh, who's stationed there uh, as per the city requirements. And we used to have bulletproof glass in this uh, reception area. And then we've requested the city to allow the modification to be in conformance with their current uh, code requirement. That was a code requirement when these were originally issued. And we've requested that to just be removed again uh, in, in, in compliance with what the city now allows to have happen. The uh, patrons are um, <clears throat> controlled access into the dispensary and we have a controlled access out through this side here. Um, the, all of the back of house is over in this area here. Uh, restrooms are accessible and then the rest of this is uh, controlled with um, cameras and access controlled doors. So there's no uh, chance of the uh, clients being able to get into the uh, private areas of the dispensary. Let's see, what else do we have? Just while, while you're going through, I'll just kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. a little bit. So just to confirm, this is an on, this is an, a currently operating facility. Correct. Uh, the city is requiring you to present some feedback from us as a planning group regarding yes. this amendment to this specific minor relaxation or amendment, if you want to call it that, um, to, a, I guess, a, a glass component to this. That's, that's all. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. I, so the, the conditional use permits that were issued for the original MMCCs, which was the cooperatives, the original cooperatives, which have been uh that's no longer allowed or that's no longer part of the, the city code ordinance they changed those to a different category a different qual um, uh, description or uh, type called cannabis out, uh, uh, outlets okay. and it's in excess in essence it's the same uh, cup but they're now called these cannabis outlets so as part of the city's original uh, desire to understand how the cannabis operation back when they were the MMCCs and now uh, as the cannabis outlets to understand how they were going to fit in, if you will, to the city. They made three or four different um, requirements uh, as part of the original ordinance. And I think you're familiar, but I'll just briefly say them. One was four outlets per council district. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest one. Um, there were things about um, and one of them was the thing I'm talking about, the glass. There was, there was in, uh, items in there about how to protect the uh, receptionist or the people working behind the desk because that area is open to the public. In other words, you can come into that area without uh, going into the dispensary. The dispensary itself is controlled access, but the reception area, like any other, uh, you know, it's like, like walking to your doctor's office, you can go in the front door to get into the uh, facility, but then you're controlled to go into the dispensary. And so, the uh, in the uh, uh, desire to, um, I think, protect or to, um, again, they weren't sure how these were going to operate in the real world. They added that requirement that the reception area was be to be ballistically protected from that recept that general public area, uh, with the I think understandable concern that somebody could come into that area and cause harm. So um, what they've discovered and what the state allows is that that's not a requirement at the state level. And they haven't had those issues in terms of these a, because there's a guard, uh, 24 hour guards. And so, uh, the legal, uh, dispensaries have not had that issue of concern of people coming in and uh, causing issues of, of, of crime or whatever, uh, with that entrance reception area. So the only thing we're asking, I just brought it up because I didn't want to let you know that it was no change at all. The bigger thing that they did when they started the MMCCs, now the <laughs> cannabis outlets, is they uh, were concerned, uh, most con conditional use permits are for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a conditional use permit, I think you all uh, understand, is a discretionary action that the that is sort of a contract, if you will, between the applicant 
uh, following rules and the city saying, these are the rules we want and you have to follow those to uh, allow you to have that. After you get your, your conditional use permit, you still have to get a building permit. So that's the second part of conditional uses uh, that's not normal. Normally you go in for a building department permit on, a, on an allowed use, but these have this extra layer of discretion and concern or review to allow for all kinds of things, safety of the community, appropriate locations, all those kinds of factors that go into the decision-making uh, by a uh, by whatever body makes that decision. These were originally uh, decided by the Planning Commission, appealed to the City Council. So uh, that original CUP had uh, uh, a five-year uh, termination. Uh, actually, it was termination, They're not an automatic extension, a termination. So they were good for five years, and then you had the option of applying for a renewal of the five-year CUP. What happened, unfortunately for all of us, is COVID happened, and the, so the city um, made the decision, which I support, and I think it was fair because otherwise it would have been very difficult to deal with these since the city was, you know, sort of shut down in some ways. Um, made the decision that they extended that um, for uh, approximately a year so that you could apply for your. Uh, uh, renewal uh, of the CUP uh, after the five year ran out. And so ours ran out last December, I believe, but they gave us this year to do the renewal. And so we were uh, in compliance with them. We applied at the right time to make the renewal. Um, the city has what's called a completeness check. And mm -hmm. once you're deemed complete, then you are allowed to keep operating the, the dispensary under the old uh, uh, conditional use permit while the city does the processing of the uh, new renewal for the CUP. So we're in to you for a straightforward renewal, a five-year uh, renewal of the now cannabis outlet, old MMCC. And I only brought up, so it's not just a little glass. I just brought the glass because I didn't want anyone to, to uh, be confused that there's a change when I didn't say, when we originally applied uh, for the renewal, I wasn't aware that the city was allowing us to remove the glass and the client uh, or the owners were aware that several of the other dispensaries in uh, the city had removed the glass. And he said, how come I can't remove the glass? And so I did a little investigation said, I think we can. And so I talked to the, uh, uh, the department, planning department and asked, can we include that in this CUP? Will that cause us any issues with the renewal? And they said, no, that's a non-material uh, issue. And so just put it in the drawing. So the drawings now not these drawings, because the drawings I sent you are the drawings that we submitted to the city, because that's what they request, which drawings are being reviewed. The only difference between this set of drawings and the drawings that we're requesting the final action on is I've removed the glass in that one little area. Okay, I, I understood that, but I wanted it for the for the good of the yeah. order and, and for the sake of the conversation, that's fine. Uh, make sure that we're not- No, uh, I, 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 I saw where you were going, DK, and I appreciate that, yeah. My pleasure. Okay, I get it. And and just to confirm, I don't. I mean, this is public knowledge, but so George Diaz is one of the owners of, of this facility. George is who used yes, to George uh, and his father have a uh, LLC that owns this. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And I remember they they were members of this board for a period of time. So I remember George. Um, George actually asked me DK to express uh, his um, uh, apologies. They had he had some uh, medical issues with his father wow. that period back then, and so he. Uh, regrets that he didn't uh, deal with it better at the time, but um, he did want to say hi, and he appreciated you. He said um, that yeah. he's, he, he knew you, and he was appreciative of it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. That's good to hear. Um, okay. I'm good with questions. If anyone else from the board or the public has a question, uh, now's a good time. Otherwise, I'm prepared to make a motion in support of the applicant's request, and I would just need to um, have a second and then call for the vote. So not seeing any questions. I will go ahead and make the motion to grant the applicant's request for approval from the Midway Pacific Highway Community Planning Group for their conditional use permit, uh, including that slight modification. Quinn, is that a question or a second? No, no, I was just going to, you know, get ready to vote. <laughs> gotcha. Amy, I see your hand up. Amy? I think you might be still on mute, but I do see your hand up if you'd like to say anything. Uh, I would like to second it. Oh, awesome. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, so we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, I did see because Amy is joined, we do have quorum now. So I will go down the roster and call for your vote. So Amy has a second or motion, yay or nay? Might still be back on mute. 
but I'm assuming you're going to. Yay. Yay. Okay. Thank you. Jason. Yay. Karen. Yay. Quentin. Yay. Chuck. Yay. All right. I'm a yay as well. That makes that unanimous. So, um, Scott, thank you. We can definitely um, circle up. I, I'm assuming you need some sort of written confirmation from me, right? Yes. Um, the, yes, we do. And the city has uh, a form supposedly. And what I'll do is talk to Travis, who's the current project manager for the city, and make sure he communicates with you to get the right form. It used to be a little more informal where you could just send in your, by email, the response. They, they've sort of upgraded the um, reporting, if you will. So I'll make sure he knows that we had a positive vote. I'll copy you on that um, email and it requests that he can, you know, coordinates with you, whatever he needs in terms of the official vote so that it goes into the record. Perfect. Thank you very much. We'll, uh, go ahead uh, real quick, it. before you go, would you mind scrolling up real quick? I think I have 3500 Escondido Street just to. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, 3500. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I want to I thank thanks you for all the info. That was I learned a lot there. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, yeah, sometimes we, you know, we we do it every day, so we're thinking about it. And I forgot that um, I, I was uh, not that's a big deal, but I was a member of the PP Planning Committee many years ago. I'm older than I look, and uh, I appreciate all that you do. I know sometimes it's sort of unsung, and um, uh, but it's uh, a valuable part of the of the process. And uh, just want to let you know, I do appreciate what everybody does. Well, thank I you. I appreciate yeah. that. Always good to hear that. Cool. Great. Have a good day. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Yep. And um, so, yeah, now uh, moving right along, we're into the CPC report. Let me hold on. There we go. Cool. Uh, into the CPC report. So at our last meeting on April 26th, we had a presentation uh, from council member Joe LaCava, who oversees District 1 or represents District 1, I should say, uh, regarding council policy 600-24 and council policy 600-9. Uh, those are the, the documents as we, I guess we're currently sort of colloquially referring to all of this as CPG reform. Um, so he came back again, it was listed as an action item. Uh, there, there's been a lot of updates since version 1.0 is what I'm calling it when he first came uh, to CPC back in November. There are I think three different drafts have, have been circulated, uh, largely incorporating all of what uh, the CPC has given. I think there are a couple small little pieces uh, that because of the city attorney's stance, uh, they were not able to change some of the language that CPC had requested for, specifically one rec uh, referring to the no cost appeals. Uh, right now, as planning groups are currently constituted or constituted, excuse me, uh, we have the ability to to appeal with no cost. And unfortunately, that is one of the things that looks like it's going to be going away. Um, we made a, a, a my understanding of the next steps is that uh, this next goes to the planning commission before going to the full city council. There isn't a date that's been docketed yet for, for that item. So we'll continue to kind of watch that. Uh, one of the other items that came up at our CPC report actually was uh, an information item about the candidate cannabis equity assessment. Uh, I came from Laura Gates, the deputy director of the cannabis business division. Uh, and it actually touched on a little bit of what Scott just touched on, some of the new changes, some of the updates to, to the code and, and what these different uh, business sectors are now required to do. And then we had um, another action item from uh, Kelly Stanko in the planning department relating specifically to the climate action plan consistency regulations. I, so I don't know how much anyone knows about the climate action plan, but just brief history. In 2015, the city instituted this document that goes to plan for all the things that uh, the climate is changing, right? So that includes resilience mechanisms as well as general uh, targets and goals for um, emissions across the city. Uh, so uh, part of that initial 1.0 version of this uh, climate action plan was that at the five-year mark, they said they would do an update. Uh, frankly, the, the city is a little bit behind in their update. Obviously, 2015, we're now in 22. It's been seven years since this thing kicked in, uh, but they are going through the process of updating it. You know, obviously, COVID impacted a few different things. Um, so one of the components, though, of this climate action plan uh, has to do specifically with buildings and consistency regulations. And so that came in front of us. The city presented. Uh, we approved uh, their their motion, their requested motion. It then went to the city's planning commission, actually, that about a week later. Um, actually, I think it might have been two days later. We, we met on Tuesday the 26th. I think it was at planning commission on the 28th. I haven't seen it come to the full council, but that comes next. And that's what we spent our time at CPC on this most recent meeting. It was interesting. Um, so not hearing any questions, I'll just touch on the chair report now. 
so at our last meeting, we all um, reviewed and discussed the, uh, I guess the formal comments that our planning group would make regarding the city's effort to redevelop the sports arena. If you recall, there was um, a city council committee, land use and housing committee meeting uh, late last month that we submitted comments to. I think it was actually the day after our meeting. So I had to turn around that letter pretty quickly. But effectively our, our letter um, <clears throat> articulated a, a desire from this board for the city to not uh, reduce the number of bids right now and to not shortlist go, going from five down to three, but to do a comprehensive financial and fiscal analysis of all five plans. And so um, the good news to report is that that request was heard by the city council committee. There was a vote, it, was a, it went 3-1. There's four members of that committee. Uh, so three of the four agreed to expand, I guess, the, the list of bidders and, or maintain the list at five and forward that conversation to the full city council. Uh, incidentally, that full city council meeting is this coming Monday, the 23rd. I don't have the agenda in front of me, but I, I can send out uh, the Zoom link if anyone's interested. Basically, the full city council will hear the same presentations that the, that the committee heard, and they'll be presented with that same choice as to whether or not to go with the staff recommendation to shortlist um, the, the three top bids or to continue doing the evaluation of all five. And so my understanding is that um, the full city council will probably uh, go in that direction, but that remains to be seen at that next meeting on Monday. Other than that, I don't think I have anything else to report as the chair. Um, I have seen uh, some comments or questions around uh, our website and, and I guess the accessibility of this group to the general public. Uh, so one of the things I'm kind of kicking around is, is how best to utilize the website. Right now, we, we, I basically update it with news articles that are relevant to the wider community um, and then also just our agendas and other events. If there's any um, I guess suggestions or comments or questions or, 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 or considerations that are different ways that we can use the website, I'm happy to to hear that, to take that on board. I think I've seen calls for, you know, more information about each of us as individual members, you know, maybe like a headshot and some biographic information. I'm comfortable with that for myself. And if anyone else is uncomfortable, now's a good time to say something. But other than that, I think uh, everything's kind of ticking along. Uh, I was really excited for the conversation with, uh, with the county and, and some of these different homelessness providers. You know, obviously we talk a lot at this committee and we have spoken a lot over the last few years about some of the challenges we have and, and you know, I wanna give credit where credit's due for the fact that some of these different agencies are starting to coordinate. And if nothing else, be more transparent and, and cooperative with us, if nothing else, you know, making themselves available to this group. I do still have obviously questions about the overall implementation of what we're gonna see, but I think, you know, I feel good about where we are today. And so I'll call that out, but that concludes my chair report. And I don't have any new business. If anyone has any new business, that was a good time. Uh, can I follow up? on the um the city council meeting dk yes, please, please do uh I, first of all i wanted to commend dk on his presentation at land use and housing extremely articulate and very well reasoned uh presentation so i wanted to thank you dk for making that i'm hoping that you're going to be able to come to the city council on monday again uh, because i'm hearing that the city council may go the other direction Oh. Uh, and so I think it'd be very uh, important for you to make that presentation again. Okay. Uh, so um, I think it's close. I think it's closer than than um, than the subcommittee. And I think that it's um, I could be wrong, but that's what I was hearing is, is that um, uh, for um, for expedient reasons and to try to move the process along, they were going to try to eliminate uh, back down to three again. So um um, but let's hope that they keep it at five, because I think that there's an important step that all all the projects be properly um, analyzed by the outside third party uh, uh, consultant. And so I would very much appreciate uh, you representing us again at the city council. Well, first of all, thank you, Chuck. It was good to see you there. So we don't get to see each other in real life too often, so thank you for that. It was good to see you. And yeah, no, I, I'm happy to go back and, and reiterate that same thing. I think there's a letter that uh, you and I are both signed on as, you know, so in addition, I'll just step back. One of the things that the action item that this group had was for us to submit a letter as a planning group. I did that to the city. Uh, there's a secondary letter that I've seen um, that I think just reiterates our same uh, stance. So that first letter was more directed to the specific committee. 
This is basically just a slightly version, I guess, slightly updated version that speaks to the entirety of the city council. I'll submit that on behalf of the planning group as well. And yes, Chuck, I'm, I'm happy to go and, and, and be present in, in chambers next week um, because I do think it's very important that we don't make any more mistakes or slip ups or cut any more corners in anything uh, in this entire process, right? So we sure. want to make sure that we keep our full attention on this effort. And yeah, I'll, I'll take care of that. Fantastic. That's good to hear. Anthony, my son is going to be out of town. Uh, so unfortunately, he won't be there, but I'll be there, of course, again. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, new business, old business. If anyone has any, now's a good time. Hearing none, I think we are prepared to adjourn at 4.32 p.m. Thank you all for the time that you spend volunteering uh, along with me. Thank you for your service, DK. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank yes, you, thanks, DK. DK. Thank you very much. I'll be in touch.